Pues vamos a dar inicio, si les parece. Sainz, dentro de sus políticas de divulgación y difusión, tiene, yo no lo sabía, la intención de abrirse al mundo, visitar instituciones como la nuestra, para dar a conocer el trabajo y las dificultades que implica publicar en una revista como esta. Tuvimos la oportunidad de conocer a Sacha a través del de Instituto de Ecología. Ellos eh, prácticamente la invitaron a México y aprovechando la estancia de ella, ha estado en diferentes instituciones. Eh, have here two or three days. Uh, four. Four days. Mm -hmm. Visitando diferentes institutos. Estuvo en fisiología, estuvo en geografía. Yesterday. College. En fin, eh, hay algunos investigadores que publican en, en Science en la universidad, dos o tres. En ecología tienen uno. Y entonces aprovechamos la presencia de Sacha, levantamos la mano y nos eh, hizo el favor, el honor de estar aquí con nosotros. Yo quisiera contextualizar un poquito la, la intervención de ella. No va a ser una presentación en PowerPoint, va a ser una charla de ella hacia nosotros en donde va a exponernos un poco sobre lo que implica publicar una revista como esta. Cuanto mayor es el prestigio, calidad o impacto de una revista como esta, más difícil es que la naturaleza del estudio y su interés sean motivos suficientes para que un artículo sea publicado. Revistas de gran, de gran prestigio como Nature o Science declinan un elevadísimo porcentaje de los manuscritos que reciben. Típicamente más del 95% de ellos son rechazados. Esto implica que muchos de los trabajos rechazados en estas revistas contengan ciencia sólida y resultados de interés general, sin embargo, pues no son aceptados. En realidad, el motivo principal de rechazo para muchos artículos tiene que ver con la limitación de espacio. Eso es algo que nos va a comentar ella. Science tiene casi 130 años de publicarse. En, eh, inició en 1880 en Nueva York, y tuvo dos patrocinadores muy interesantes. Uno de ellos fue Tomás Alva Edison, conocido por darle tanto a Estados Unidos como a Europa los perfiles tecnológicos del mundo contemporáneo en materia de la industria eléctrica, sistemas, eh, un sistema telefónico viable, el fonógrafo, las películas. Y posteriormente un segundo patrocinador fue Alexander Graham Bell, científico inventor británico, que contribuyó al desarrollo de las telecomunicaciones y a la tecnología de la aviación. Science es la revista científica y órgano de expresión de la Asociación Estadounidense para el Avance de la Ciencia desde 1994. Si ustedes ven en el cartel del lado derecho, el logotipo de Science tiene tres A's y una S, y esas eh, explican que es la Asociación Estadounidense para el Avance de la Ciencia, desde 1994 así se pronuncia, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Esta organización, que promueve la cooperación entre los científicos, defiende la libertad científica, fomenta la responsabilidad científica y apoya la educación científica para beneficio de toda la humanidad. La AAAS incluye a más de 250 instituciones y academias de ciencia que atienden a más de 10 millones de miembros y representan la mayor federación de sociedades científicas y de ingeniería en el mundo. El objetivo central de Science es la publicación de hallazgos de investigación reciente. Ellos lo llaman origen primario. Science es también conocida por sus Science Related News, noticias relacionadas con la ciencia, que es una publicación sobre política científica y otros asuntos relacionados con la ciencia y la tecnología. Cubre un amplio rango de disciplinas científicas, pero tiene especial interés en las ciencias de la vida. Ella nos va a platicar un poco de cuál es su especialidad como editor senior dentro de Science. Para, 1900, para 2014, el factor de impacto de Science fue de 35.26 en promedio de los cinco años anteriores. En 2007, esta revista fue galardonada con el, Príncipe, con el Premio Príncipe de Asturias de Comunicación y Humanidades, junto con la otra revista, Nature. Nuestra invitada, Sacha Vinieri, desarrolló el amor por la naturaleza desde su infancia, cerca de las montañas rocallosas o montañas rocosas, como se les entiende, 
persiguiendo insectos y explorando con sus perros. La llevó a interesarse en el comportamiento animal que siguió durante sus años de estudio en la Universidad de Berkeley. El deseo de tener un conocimiento más experimental la condujo a un posgrado en este tema sobre una variedad de especies como son los murciélagos de la fruta de, en Samoa, los lobos marinos en el Ártico. Durante este tiempo se interesó por las interacciones ecológicas entre los individuos y entre los individuos y su entorno. Esto la llevó a su doctorado en zoología en la Universidad de Washington, donde recibió una beca de la EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Su interés en comprender mejor el papel de la selección en la interacción con el medio la llevó a dirigir su, su investigación postdoctoral con una beca presidencial en, en la Universidad de California, en San, en San Diego, y una beca Elizabeth Cary Agassiz en Harvard. Cuando constata ella que la valoración de la naturaleza y las ciencias naturales disminuían rápidamente, la llevó a buscar la manera de llegar tanto a la comunidad científica como al público en general, y es así como Sacha es ahora un editor senior de la revista Science. A menudo Sacha se pierde persiguiendo especies como los ratones, pero ella dice, la mayor parte del tiempo vale la pena el sacrificio para aumentar la capacidad de visibilidad del trabajo realizado sobre los sistemas naturales. Abriendo la caja negra, la perspectiva de un editor en la publicación científica es el tema de la exposición de Sacha, para quien solicito le demos una cordial bienvenida. Not every day we have a senior editor of a journal prestigious as a science. Sacha Vinieri, it's an honor to have you here in the Engineering Institute. Would you like to start your talk? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, muchas gracias for having me. It's very nice to be here and nice to have a chance to talk with you all. We uh, discussed a little bit the style of talk that would be best uh, for our time and so we decided probably not for me to just stand up and give a PowerPoint talk but instead to just give you a little background and then just open for questions and discussion. I find that that often is the most rewarding and productive time to spend with people. So just a little background on science. Um, as you probably know, and we just heard, um, science is a large, high-impact factor general science journal. And what that means is that we publish across all of the sciences, so physics, chemistry, biology, all of the components of biology. And we publish about 800 papers a year, but we receive about 13,000 submissions a year. So we have only about a 5% acceptance rate. And so this is why it is very difficult to publish in science in general. Um, it is very competitive no matter what we do. And um, I, in engineering is one of those things that is a more applied science. And so sometimes I think that engineers feel that it's not as easy to publish in science, even above and beyond how difficult it is for a biological scientist or chemist or physicist. And so the first thing I want to say is that there is a new journal called Science Advances. I don't know how, if any of you have heard of it. It's a, the new open access journal that AAAS is publishing. And one of the goals of Science Advances is to be able to publish more broadly. And I know they have discussed engineering as something that they would like to see more of and be able to publish more of. So to be able to publish more things that are applied. So hopefully that will give you all some more opportunities to publish within a science journal. Um, so in terms of publishing engineering, one of the things that we see when it is published is that it typically, so one of the things about science in general is that what, what we're looking for is a, a study or research that ha represents a large conceptual advance. So we want work that really pushes a field forward. So there's many, many, many papers that are excellent and exciting and important and novel, and we don't have room to publish them all. And so what we're trying to find are those papers that really move a field into its next phase, maybe change the way people think. And so when you think about engineering, your field, which you all know much, much better than I do, um, you, I guess you have to think about when would it be the case where a scientific uh, 
idea or component would be involved enough to push something forward. Um, so sometimes we have robotics papers that might represent a kind of engineering. So we see less um, papers on civil engineering and those kinds of things in science, but it doesn't mean they couldn't ever appear there. It just depends on how large is the, is the science component. Are you addressing scientific questions? And we see this. It's not just an issue for fields like engineering. Also in conservation, where, which I handle quite a bit of, we also have the, the challenge of sometimes a study might be very important in that it conserves a particular species, but the science itself is not a big advance, and those papers we also aren't able to pursue. So it's challenging with these more applied fields. Um, but we are definitely open to things and, um, and hope that you will continue to think about how your work might ever fit. Um, and I guess with that, I'm, I'm happy to start any questions. I can talk more about the process, or um, if we can discuss whatever you all would like. Any other, any questions? Um, feel free to ask me anything. I know people often are nervous, they're shy, they don't want to say a negative thing. But believe me, I everywhere I go, I hear very many negative opinions. <laughs> Lots of people have complaints about science, and I and I that's part of the reason we come and do these visits is so we can help people express themselves and understand. Hi, uh, thank you for visiting us today. Yeah. Um, as uh, you are one of the most prestigious uh, journals in, in the world, uh, also famous uh, out of the scientific community, uh, scientific community as uh, Nature or some other journals, in, um, <coughs> have you planned or have you thought about how to try to um, use the new technologies, the new diffusion technologies through the internet, through the social nets, and all these things in order to um, enhance uh, the significance of the uh, significance uh, and the importance of uh, the scientific development uh, through the younger ones, through the young communities. Yeah, it means, um, try to say, uh, for example, um, uh, trying to uh, allowing the youngest ones to find <laughs> thank you <laughs> so the question is in this way how how to diffuse the significance of the science in order to provide in a more logical, uh, actual way um, the significance of this field to the youngest ones. Yeah. So when you say youngest ones, you mean sort of young professionals. So No. No. Or children. Yeah, children. Okay. I'm, I mean, um, I mean uh, the media, it's focusing uh, to certain things. And if you talk to a kid, they want to be rock stars or want to get inside a uh, big brother, yeah. football, so soccer, or whatever. Or even, as we saw uh, recently, they would be a master chef. But yeah. it's uh, quite, yeah, I mean, yeah. what? Drug lords. Drug yeah. lords, yeah. So, yes. which would be the way in order to diffuse in, a, in a, through the new technologies a little bit of reference yeah. in order to uh, put this, um, this interest inside, inside the kids, inside yes. the youngest ones. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, what I, one thing that has been happening for a while is a project called Science in the Classroom, where they take papers, which often are my papers, because my papers concern animals and things like that, and they translate it into um, a way that can be presented within a class. And then they distribute that to all the, any teacher in the country, in the US, that might want it. And so they do that kind of a semi-regular basis to get actual published science into classrooms so people start to think about it, children start to think about it and have access. So in terms of sort of the more media-based things, I mean, to some degree, that science is getting into media. There's, you know, social media and those kinds of things that they're 
you know, the journal's very active in. They do produce small video shorts about, for example, women in science. There was a recent series where they profiled several women scientists, um, went out, and one of them was for a paper that I had handled. She studied grasshopper mice and scorpions. They followed her into the field. Um, and so they, they do a little bit of that. It, it is a challenge, though, because I think things like MasterChef and football, they operate in a, in a little bit different world than science. And so in some ways, it would be nice if we could get some of those media people to want to take you know, some of our stories and develop them into this broader. So you see that a little bit in things like the Discovery Channel. And you know, there's a lot of that kind of science out there. But it is, it is a bigger challenge. And I don't... I. I mean, as far as what AAAS does, I think they do try to bridge that gap in terms of education and, and international education, science diplomacy. But yeah, it's a good point. It would be nice to see a little more focus on, on sort of the popular media. But I'm not sure that AAAS would take that as their task, rather than sort of providing the materials, hoping somebody else would take up the, the mantle. But yes, I agree with you. It, it's a... I mean, my son wants to be a scientist, but you know, it's true. Most children aren't aren't don't see that as a an option, and so maybe maybe we can think about that more in the future. Unfortunately, it's out of my hands, but I can always make suggestions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, as you were saying, um, well, obviously there is a lot of. Um, how can I say this, uh, pollution in the air uh, of people saying that uh, publishing in science is very difficult, not only due to this rate mm. of uh, success that is very little, but also because there are groups that have somehow kidnapped the, mm. the journal. Mm -hmm. So what are the policies that the editorial board is taking to actually diminish this yeah. perception? It's a perception, I'm not saying Yes, so true. that is tricky because it is a perception. It's not reality. Certainly within science, we don't have that um, practice. So, for example, I don't even read the names of the authors of papers I handle until well after I've read the paper and made an opinion of it. Um, and in general, we do try very hard not to have particular people be selected because of particular the who they are. I mean, in fact, sometimes, you know, who they are might make it even harder for them because we've already had a paper by them just recently. Um, but I, I do think what happens is um, when you get a paper in science, you get more funding, you get job offers, you get tenure, you get, get... And so when you get those, then you're able to do more research. So in fact, one person said that they thought that a science paper had worth, been worth about a million dollars in funding for them. So you can imagine that in that situation, then that person now has a million dollars in funding that some other person doesn't have. They can produce more and, and end up in the journal again. So I think that's what really happens, rather than people actually sort of kidnapping the journal and, and just taking over um, in a way that is exclusive. So how can we reduce the perception? I mean, I think the only way we can really do it is by talking to people. Because, I mean, we, we do, our practice is to not have that happen. And people don't know that unless they've heard it. Um, I mean, we, we, we try to get the word out there. But the problem is there's always going to be a feeling of frustration among authors because almost everybody gets published from science all the time. I mean, not published, rejected. So it's, so, and everybody feels bad about that. So there's, and there's a lot of, and when you feel bad and you've been rejected, there's a, a need to, to have a reason. And so the reason is because only 5% of people ever get accepted. But there's also a, a personalized feeling about it. People take it personally or they feel that, oh, it's because these other groups publish their only. And, and those things aren't real, but that's what you feel, right? And so I think what we try to do is get the word out, tell people about our process, open up the black box about how the editorial process works. Actually, maybe very quickly, I'll just explain that. Um, 
before we go on with more questions, because I, when I do my talk, I explain it, but I realized I haven't yet. So the way the selection process works at Science is a paper comes in, it's assigned to an editor based on their area of expertise. So mine is organismal biology. So I cover anything to do with an animal that's not a model system. So the paper comes in, it's assigned to an editor. The editor then reads the paper, develops an opinion about it, writes it down in a database. We then send the paper out to people that we call members of our board of reviewing editors. So these are active researchers in fields that we cover, and we select them to come and help us to give, by giving sort of an in-house review. This is a review short. It's basically just their impression of the paper, and we ask them, if we assume that this is correct, do you think it has it will have an impact in your field? So then we take that opinion and our opinion, and then we recommend an action. So whether it's rejection without review, which is 75% of all papers we receive, or to go to review. And then at each step, so after the reviews come in, the editor assesses them and makes a recommendation for the next step. So at each step, we have this discussion among the relevant editors, and then eventually a paper will either get rejected or accepted. So it's quite an, it's quite an extended process. Um, and that also helps to prevent the fact that certain people might just be coming in because when you just have a single editor making an opinion, making a decision, it's easier for that single editor to maybe say, oh, you know, this person, I really like their work. Every time they come, I will review their paper. But when you have these external advisors as well as other editors in the decision process, those people are not in that same group. So, th so I can say to somebody, you know, I don't think this work is a conceptual advance. And then that, my opinion, will have an impact on the decision. So I, I think that what we can do to get rid of this perception is just provide more information about the process and to try to assure people that it is our goal to just publish the best science, regardless of who it comes from and where it comes from. We do want to publish internationally, and we do try very hard. One thing we try very hard to do is accommodate for language barriers, because believe me, I can't write a paper in, sci in Spanish or French or Russian or, you know, and so I'm always very respectful of people who can write a paper in a second language. So we, we do try to accommodate for that. Um, and so there, these barriers that I think people feel, they're not really there. It's just that when everybody's getting rejected all the time, you start to feel like they have to be. But it's just a numbers game, really. Thank you, Ms. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have a few questions. OK. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for your presence here with Thank us. Thank you. Uh, first of all, how is the impact factor built? That's oh. question number one. Okay. And the other question is uh, regarding the different, the huge differences I have observed between the uh, large impact factors in certain um, areas of knowledge. You just mentioned the science, biology, maybe uh, uh, biological sciences in general, physics, astronomy, etc., as opposed to the very low, very small low impact factors that we get in certain areas as ours, mm -hmm. specifically engineering, civil engineering, etc., where if you get an impact factor larger than, say, 0.5, that's huge for <laughs> some persons. Yeah. That's the second question. And the third question is whether the impact factor is an actual fair parameter in order to evaluate the careers of academics. Mm. Okay, I think I will... I mean, you might not have to remind me of the three questions, um, but I'll try to remember. Okay, so the first question, how impact factor is built. So I have to tell you that I don't care that much about impact factor. Um, and my field within biology is actually a relatively low impact field. And impact factor is largely driven by the size of a field. So how many researchers work in your field? So in immunology, one of our highest impact fields, there's hundreds of thousands of researchers. And so you publish a paper, and they all work on kind of the same things. 
So you publish a paper and it gets highly cited. Same thing in physics. And um, so it's, it's not a reflection of the value of the work. It's a reflection of the size of the field. So in my field, ecology, evolution, you know, if you get, um, you know, if you, in a year, if you have a paper that gets 25 citations, that's big deal. Um, so it, it's really field dependent. And so, in fact, it's not something that science, I mean, certainly there are people within the journal who care. But the editors understand that it is not something that we should be making decisions about publication on in particular. And so, particularly for AAAS and science, where the mission is to publish papers across all scientific fields, the fact that, say, my field is much lower impact than immunology doesn't mean that we won't publish any papers in my field. So it is, it's something that is unfortunately part of publishing, but for us, it's not something that drives big decisions about coverage. Um, so now how it's constructed, I believe it's sort of the average um, number of citations per paper per it's not it's not just per year it's it's some construct that's actually a, kind of complicated and I think a little bit excessive <laughs> um, and so um, it really has to do with like how many citations do you get per number of papers and number of pages even so that's kind of roughly a translation um, just one comment so, so I would like to stress the fact that you just mentioned that it's the size of the field okay Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, so, and so because we know this is true, um, we do recognize, and I think I would say that probably all of science really recognizes that impact factor is not necessarily the best way to be assessing things. And there are alternative approaches. Um, I don't know if, how many of you have heard of this altmetric score, which is basically a way to measure kind of the excitement that a paper generates, both in terms of how many times it's cited, how many times it's discussed on the internet, on social media. So we look at those now. Um, so we are trying to you know, think outside the box in terms of how, how to evaluate our own papers without just depending on impact factor. Because as you said, it doesn't really reflect anything other than how, how many people can cite a paper. And so for that reason, to answer your last question, I don't think it's a good way to evaluate researchers. And I think it's very unfortunate that the, one of the main things that's happened in the scientific community is that science and nature papers have become sort of the way to decide if somebody should get a job or be promoted or get tenure. And I don't think that's right. Um, and un unfortunately, there's, there's only so much that, I mean, the journal can't really do anything about it. It's the, the community that has to do something about it. But it's a bit of a catch-22 because the community is stuck within a system where there's a lot of researchers. So I was on a faculty search committee when I was a graduate student, and we had 600 applicants. So how do you read all the papers and assess the quality of the body of work for 600 people? So it's, a, it's really hard. And I, I, when I travel, I get this question every time I talk to people. And so the good news, I think, is that people are thinking about it a lot. And occasionally I'll hear of a department where they've decided not to count those higher than other publications. So I, I do think there's a little bit of a change coming. Uh, but I don't think it's that fast. And I agree with you that it, it's not the right way to do it. But I appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. Um, you you mentioned you had a uh, you have a very high rejection rate. Mm. Uh, two questions. This is the first one. Um, how 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 much of how many of the papers or percentage of those rejected papers are upfront reject re, have upfront rejection? Prior to review, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Before going to the reviewers. Yes. So probably about seventy five percent. 75% of yeah. those, so only 25% will go, we'll go and to eventually review. be rejected. 
Yeah, so only 25% will, will go to review, and then eventually yeah. a large portion of those will also still, be rejected. Still rejected. Yes. So, so uh, let's suppose I have a very nice manuscript with uh, good ideas, in my opinion. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's... Yeah. Um, this originality, this a there is a contribution. Mm -hmm. Applied research. Oh, let, mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, have this in mind. Yeah. What? Uh, which uh, question or key question or questions should I make myself uh, in order to decide whether or not send it to science? What yeah. should I ask myself? Uh, seeing my paper, reading yeah. my paper. So there's. I, I would say there's kind of two main questions to ask yourself. The first one is, does this question or set of findings have the potential to be broadly interesting? So, for example, could a person who's a biologist look at your paper and say, hmm, I can see, I might not understand everything about this, but I can see why this might be an interesting question. So that's the first thing, because um, in some fields, especially, and, and less so, I think, in applied fields. But in, in a lot of pure science fields, there's some work that's just very, very detailed. It answers a very specific question of a very in, within a very specific part of a field. It might do a great job of it. It might be novel, what they find. But it really only makes sense to a small group of people. That's not right for science, because our purview, our mission, is to try to be broad and general. So that's the first one. Is it, is it broad or is it specialized? Then the second thing is this idea of the conceptual advance. Does it really move a field forward? Um, so not just do, are we adding information, are we adding understa increased understanding of sort of a concept or practice we already know a bit about, but am I really pushing out? Am I moving everybody forward? Is it changing the way people think or or really increasing our understanding of something that's key but is not known. So those kinds of findings are what we're looking for. Um, our goal is to find papers and publish papers that other people within the field would say, you know, that paper is really good. That, that one should be in Science Over Mine, my current work. Um, because that's sort of the litmus test for you know, something that's really a big advance. And so that's what we're looking for. Now, we don't always get it right, and we definitely make mistakes, but that's our goal. So when you're looking at your own work, I think you can ask, you know, those three questions. Like, is it broad? Is it a conceptual advance? And do my colleagues agree that this is really kind of pushing us forward? I have a question regarding, well, two questions uh, regarding Editorial help and page charges. Mm -hmm. you, uh, there are, I, I think there are. It's a variable policy, and I have a, a rejection rate in science and nature. They, we, we know the answer. The, the paper is rejected in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, this is a very specialized paper. It's not use. It's not interested. Right. For, for, for this. But, uh, and that what, what we see now is that there are. Uh, uh, changes in the market and with, with the brand name of science or nature or proceedings of the Royal Society, there are another another new journals that appear. You know, in nature there are geosciences, neurosciences. Yeah. And so, and the presentations are now, um, you know, the market is, is growing because the journals are also growing as well. So, regarding the page charges and what about uh, if people ask for your help for, you know, there are several papers supporting an idea, and the idea is to communicate to broad audience. Do you have a kind of a specialized team to support, uh, to make a project, to say, to make a report, to make a letter, to make a news? So there are a lot of perspectives, perspectives that are uh, interesting papers that give a broad uh, idea of the, of the thing. And sometimes perspectives come along with the important research paper or news. Hmm. There are, uh, I think, to, to reach the technology market, maybe is when, when some idea is uh, supported by several papers in other specialized journals, maybe there will be some uh, bulk of idea that may be distributed or maybe diffused among people. Yeah. So okay. that's uh, 
you know, the question is just general. Yeah. So as re with regards to your first question, page charges. So open access journals charge a lot to publish in. Um, science is not open access, except that it is open access after one year. So after one year, all science papers are open access and free to access. But because um, we're not open access in the beginning, the charges are actually very small. Um, there's charge for color, and the charge for pages is small to none. Um, but there is assistance, so you know if you can make a case for not being able to pay the color charges, for example, they're pretty good about waiving those. So it actually costs very little to publish in science, um, which is probably good because the idea is to give a venue to work that's really pushing things forward, and so we're excited to have that work, so therefore you know, it kind of makes sense that we're not charging people a lot for it. Um, you know, in open access journals, you do have to pay a lot, and Science Advances is an open access journal, so they are having charges, um, but they are pretty good, as far as I've been able to see, about waiving them. Um, the second question, which I think you're asking about whether there's a forum for sort of writing commentary about work that's maybe kind of around or emerging. So there's two formats, well, there, Mostly two, maybe with a third that's kind of like that. The first one is there's reviews. We publish reviews where people can review work that's being done or the state of a field or the current level of knowledge within a particular question. And that allows researchers to sort of comment on where a field is and where it's going. The other one is called a perspective. And that's shorter, but that allows people to write a, a bit more opinion-based commentary on work that's being done. Sometimes it's just on a single paper. Sometimes it's on sort of a suite of papers that have come out. And then third is a letter, which is really like pure opinion, but very short um, and not peer-reviewed. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to comment about. And I'd say for both review and perspective, you can just submit those, but it also can be helpful to contact the editor first and, and just say, these are my, this is an idea, this is an important thing that's happening, and here's what I'd like to say about it. And the, the, ed, the email, ac email addresses of all the editors are on the science website, and it says what, what we cover. So if you're looking at a review, to talk about a review or perspective, you could email the editors that cover reviews and perspectives directly. Um, so there are a few options for, for that. Um, you did mention something about getting rejected very quickly from science and nature. So science usually takes longer than 24 hours. Typically at science, it's a few days to two weeks for that first decision. Nature, it can be very quick. In fact, when I was submitting papers to Science and Nature, I remember submitting a paper to Nature, and the guy down the hall submitted a paper to Nature. And I was so excited, because it took 24 hours for them to reject mine, but his got rejected like after lunch. You know, he submitted four lines and was rejected. So they do it very quick, and I think in part it's because the editor is more directly involved in the decision. Like, so they actually can make the decision without this process that we undertake. They say, we don't judge value. They say, very, in very polite way, that they don't judge the quality, but they seem that the, there, are, there may be another forum. Right, another yeah, forum. A better forum. Yes. More specialized. And yes, yep. Yeah. We say something similar. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Thank you. I'm not scientific. I'm designer. Uh -huh. Well, I have a questions about the image in public and scientific publishing. In, sorry. How? In a branch, do you consider it important for scientists publishing importance in the image? Um, is important for you, for your publications? Um, the scientists must 
consider important support her publishing with image, images? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite clear. Do you want to say it in Spanish and then somebody can tell uh, me in English? Okay. Just because I, I'm having trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, ¿Tú consideras importante que las imágenes científicas en tus publicaciones, qué tan importantes son para, para ustedes? Y si los científicos que quieren publicar deberían tomar la importancia, deberían voltear hacia, hacia las imágenes, porque en, anteriormente no se consideraban importantes, sin embargo, ahora en la era digital cada vez es más necesario el soporte visual en las publicaciones. Yo lo considero así. The image in the publication are very important. So the, the way that it looks, the pictures and presentation, yes, it, it's... See, sí, yes, it's very important. Um, we have an entire section a department whose job, that's separate from us, whose job is just to produce the image of the journal. Um, and they've recently, in the past few years, completely kind of reorganized and re are redesigning the print and the online and producing more video content. And so, yes, it's, it is important. And there's a lot of designers involved. and um, a lot of effort put into trying to improve the way readers even interact with not just the, the part of the journal that's sort of the news part, and, but also even the papers, you know, thinking about ways that, you know, let's say if you had a PDF, you could click on a figure and maybe you could show the data. Or, so there's a lot of thought about how to improve interaction with the, the media, and so it's very important. Hello, <clears throat> I'm a PhD student here in the institute. Uh, well, my question is, um, the institute is about engineering, and science is, well, about science. So uh, you said that there is a, for, for publishing on science, uh, your question should be a very broad question, so many scientists will be interested in your question. The thing is, with engineering, uh, we are solving specialized problems, not big questions. I mean, mm -hmm. and of course, we use science. We make the science advance. But we made the science advance by introduction, uh, by the introduction of engineering stuff, like, for example, let's say telephones, or let's say tablets. And of course, that's is, it will not be seen as an advance in science, maybe. Right. Not as uh, discovering the, the pollution, a, po a pollution problem or, or something that sensibilizes people mm -hmm. in general, scientists or not. But when someone uses your telephone and says, oh Siri, can you tell me that? They actually are not seeing the science behind it. They are just seeing the, the gadget and oh my God, the engineers are advancing a lot. But they do not see the all the science that is behind. I mean, the, the neural networks, all the math that is needed to, to do that. Mm -hmm. They just think in the wires and so. So, as an engineer, how can we know that our work is making a breakthrough in mm -hmm. the in the way people think? When tablets came out, everybody was laughing about them. It's like it's not a computer. It's mm -hmm. not a telephone. It's it's it's. Uh, yes, <laughs> it's horrible. This will never go on. Now even children are using a, a tablet. So yeah. I think in engineering, the question is different from in general science or in not applied science, let's call it like that. Hmm. Theoretical science, I don't know how to call them. But um, how how open is science to the, the magazine, I mean, the, the journal, to, yeah. to publish engineering work that is not seen as scientific? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say not very often. 
Um, and I think part of that just has to do with the fact that we're already struggling with, you know, all of science that, you know, so trying to publish everything that, that falls in that class, that category of classic science. And we already are publishing, you know, a five, only 5%. So it's hard to expand out of that into other fields that are not pure science because, there's a lot of those too, and we already are disappointing most people. So we, we do try to limit our categories to things that really are making an advance in science. So one thing that we often end up having to reject a lot of, um, even within science, are things that are big methodological advances, which I think in many ways is sort of what you're describing. So how you produce something, and, and all these things are incredibly important, right? But the, the key there is you're mostly describing sort of the, the methods of making something better. And we can't publish those in, in other fields either. So, you know, we might get a paper that's on, you know, how, how to publish um, or how to improve, let's say, my field, tracking of animals. And if it's only showing the method, we can't publish it. It has to actually be used within a context that actually answers a scientific question. So I think that's a way to think about, you know, when your work might fit into science is when you're using some kind of method that's been developed to answer a particular question that might be scientific. Sometimes it can be um, conservation or health oriented too. So we do, I have seen engineering papers that are more about sort of improving water cleanliness. You know, those kinds of papers will sometimes make it in, I think, because they have um, sort of a direct translation into health or environment. So I think that's really where, where we are able to publish some engineering is in work that develops something through an engineering process and then uses it to address a specific question or a specific problem. Um, that is of broad interest, so health or uh, conservation, those kind of things. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. It's Again, I, it comes down to this idea that science and nature are the place to publish for everybody, which is ridiculous because we can't publish everything. You know, and science has been around for, you know, 150 years just publishing science. And it's only in the past 60, 70 years, 60 years, that it started to kind of climb as this thing that you're supposed to publish in. And I don't know why that happened. I mean, maybe somebody else might know, but I have no idea. And, um, and because that happened, then suddenly it was like, everybody's supposed to publish there. So engineers, social scientists. I mean, I even get people in humanities asking me, well, does science publish humanities? You know, and we just can't do it. So again, it comes down to the idea that it's a, com it's a problem with the academic community and how they evaluate people. Um, because there's just no possible way that we can publish everything. So... You know, it's maybe not a satisfactory answer, but I think that's that's the problem um, that we face. Thank you. Um, I, I was just thinking. So, uh, could you tell us uh, the percentage of papers or perspectives or news that are related to engineering? I know. I I don't have those numbers. Um, More or less. Yeah, it's, it's low. I mean, you know, so for example, one of my fields, let's say evolution, we publish about 3% of our papers in evolution. And so you know, that's pretty low. <laughs> but that's a, a field, like one of the few fields that I handle. So, you know, that's an active field. So if you think about something like engineering, where it's pretty rare, it has to be kind of a special paper, you know. You're looking at 0.5, maybe 0 0.5, yeah. So what I was thinking is perhaps if uh, from, the, from, a, from an, an engineering perspective, uh, your work, apart from being novel and so on and so forth, perhaps it should be uh, 
multidisciplinary, no? or you should have some interaction with mm -hmm. other fields of knowledge, not only engineering. Yeah. That's one, perhaps one key thing to have. And the other one is, uh, does science uh, have a policy to include, say, knowledge that is not making, uh, making the, a better world? Say, for mm -hmm. instance, how the engineering may aid uh, a better decision-making, for yeah. instance, which is m mainly the, the focus, perhaps, for, for engineering. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think your first point is, is definitely correct. That I think that, and I would say that this is where m most of the engineering that's published in science comes in, is in interdisciplinary work. So, you know, work where you're using engineering to solve a water issue problem that may then improve a health outcome or a similar set of combinations. And so, yes, I think that's true. And I th actually think that's true in a lot of fields. Interdisciplinary work is definitely becoming more and more important. Um, and then your second question, remind me. <laughs> oh, the, the good of the world. Yeah, so, um, I mean, certainly that is kind of, that is the sort of the underlying mission of AAAS. And so, yes, that's true. And I think that, I mean, depending on what it, the work was and what the good was, you know, that might, that might be a place where it could, help a particular engineering study fit. So, um, but I, and I think in a lot of cases that ends up being interdisciplinary, but I think that's, that's right. I mean, there is a, it's sort of getting to that broader interest, right? So now certainly like figuring out how to make a tablet work, I mean, that is incredibly broad interest and broad, broadly importance in terms of the fact that people use them all the time. But, you know, sort of demonstrating the science of it within that, tablet, it's, it's sort of specific, right? It's a methodological thing. So the good of it kind of comes with the fact everybody uses it. And so it's, it's the actual report is not the same as the good. Whereas I think probably what would fit in science better is where you can show the engineering and how it's then employed to produce the, the good outcome. And, and that would be something that would be more appropriate. Sasha, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very much for your time. Está con nosotros Clementina Equiwa, quien es la responsable de que Sasha esté con nosotros. Muchas gracias, Clementina. Muchas gracias a todos. Le damos un aplauso a Sasha. Thank you.